think we can uh, start. And um, so welcome everybody to today's uh, IAMP One World Mathematical Physics Seminar. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Costanza Rojas Molina from uh, Université uh, Sergi Paris. And um, the title of today's presentation is Fractional Random Schrodinger Operators, Integrated Density of States and Localization. So let me say that uh, as usual, the, um, the seminar will be recorded and, and made available on YouTube. And having said that, uh, I leave the floor to Costanza, please. Thanks. First of all, thank you for the invitation today. Um, I'm very happy to be here with all of you, um, even if it's remotely. So uh, today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you uh, about some, some things that we've been working on with uh, Martin Geber from Munich. And uh, so this is the idea of the structure. So first we're going to... Uh, going to see a little introduction for those, um, well, I know that there are many experts in the audience, but for those that are um, maybe newcomers, an introduction to the problem of random Schrodinger operators, and then what is the model, um, what, is, what is the motivation for to looking at this fractional Anderson model, and then our results on the integrate density of states and if it's state. And then um, hopefully we will um, have the time to see some extensions and to see some open problems that would be interesting to, to see in the future. Um, so please don't hesitate to, um, to interrupt me. If at some point you think uh, you have any questions, you can interrupt me, or if the audio is not, my, my connection is not good also. Okay, so um, the, the object that we want to study is, uh, we want, is this operator that has um, this kinetic part the, that is minus the Laplacian to some fractional power that is between zero and one. So we write it as alpha over two because it's just convenient, um, plus a random potential. And um, that is, uh, you can see this as a diagonal uh, disorder. And we want to study the spectral and dynamical properties of this operator. And we consider, uh, we can consider the setting of the continuum. So we can think this works on, oh, sorry, this is L2 of RD and L or L little L2 of D. And um, this is the main um, topic that, uh, the main object that we're interested in. And the case alpha equals two, um, here you retrieve the, the usual Laplacian. Uh, this is a well-known case. Uh, this is the Anderson model, and it has been very thoroughly studied in the literature, in the framework of, of random Schrodinger operators. So before jumping in to study this fractional model, I would like to spend a bit of time talking about the Anderson model, what is very well known. So one study is um, motivated by, uh, um, by the study of electronic transport in disordered materials. So when we have that, we can see if, uh, two possible uh, behaviors. Either the material is a conductor, so in which case the, uh, the, the current propagates, or it is an insulator, in which case the current stays. Uh, it doesn't go through the material. And Anderson observed in 1958 that when the material has impurities, then uh, there is no propagation of electrons in, in a case where a material would have been a conductor. Uh, but because of these impurities, then it behaves as an insulator. And this is what's called today Anderson localization. And he got a Nobel Prize for this discovery in 1977. And then, um, and then people started, uh, mathematicians started to wondering, well, what is, what is the, uh, a mathematical framework for this uh, phenomenon? And for that, well, the first thing is the model. And this is what uh, Anderson proposed since um, we have, we have a material, we have um, the atoms on, on a certain place on a certain um, lattice, and we have this store ways can cast location from the positions of the lattice, or it can come uh, atoms. So for example, this would be this picture that we have two types of atoms, but since we don't know in which place we have which kind of atom or what kind of disorder, well, Anderson proposed, let's consider all possible configurations of this. 
So this leads us to consider a probability space where we consider all possible configurations of these uh, types of atoms. And, and this is the way we integrate the disorder in the model. So we have, um, so then if we want to study the electronic transport in these materials, we're going to consider a Hamiltonian that represents the energy of the particle, where we will have the uh, negative Laplacian plus a potential that will represent what the electron uh, sees around it. And um, this is a one particle model. And we uh, consider, we think that this fills the whole space. Um, although this, this is just an idealization of what happens in the lab, of course, we don't have infinite uh, samples. But um, so the phenomenon that we're going to, to, to look at is something that happens in the infinite limit. So when, the, when, the, when we look at the whole space. Um, and here the potential then will be a, a potential generated by a, a, random, a random vector. Um, so to have, a, to have a picture here, um, there are two images. So on the continuous setting, a random potential would, would look like, like this. So on every point of the lattice, you have a little bump function that is smooth, that is regular, compactly supported, and then the and then the height of this bump function will be regulated by some random um, parameter. And when we consider all possible realizations of these random variables, then what we have are many possible landscapes uh, with uh, hills and valleys with different. Now, this is a, a continuous analogy, analogy of what happens in the discrete setting. And there is just a side potential on each point of the lattice, you put a random variable, okay? So this is our operator. And now, um, um, so now we put this in, in, the, in the machinery to study electronic transport. This uh, Hamiltonian will generate an evo a time evolution this will tell us how the electrons propagate in space. So this will tell us, give us the dynamic of the electron that is represented by some wave function. Um, so now we have this evolution that is generated by this random potential. And the manifestation of this disorder, so what happens, um, because we have this randomness in the material, what we see is localization in certain regions of the spectrum under certain conditions. Um, so typically in near the spectral gaps or, or else in, in a big portion of the spectrum, if we assume that the disorder is very strong so that the height of our, our, our hills in the landscape will be very, very tall. In, under those conditions, we see uh, this, uh, that this quantity is finite. And what this quantity is, uh, is saying is that it's in a way quantifying how concentrated or, or spread out the function is in time. So we start with a function that is completely supported, and then we let it, we restrict ourselves to the spectral subspace that is that corresponds only to the part of the spectrum that we're looking at. And then we let this evolve under the action of our time evolution. And then at a certain time t, we, uh, we uh, multiply by this uh, space coordinate. So this is, we're taking here a weighted norm um, with this polynomial term. And of course, if the function starts completely supported, but if, if on time this, the function starts to spread out, this quantity will contribute a lot to the norm and this quantity will grow. So this would be when there is spreading, when there's propagation. Now, when we don't have that, so the, the other extreme would be that this quantity stays bounded for all times. Uh, and that means that the function, it started completely supported and then it spreads perhaps a little bit, but then it stays localized in, in a region of space near where it started. So if we ask this quantity to be uniformly bounded in time and in expectation, then what we see is that our electrons will not propagate because the wave functions will stay localized. Okay, so here we have two aspects of this what we call dynamical localization, we have a dynamical aspect. That means that the function, that the wave functions that are bound states, so they don't spread in space. Um, and they are also exponentially decaying. And there is another uh, aspect that is spectral. That, and this 
concerns the operator. The operator H omega exhibits pure point spectrum with exponentially decaying eigenfunctions. And of course, this results for almost every omega. So that means that for almost every configuration of the potential. So in general, we want, we, we make some assumptions on our operator that is regarding so that all the results that we have will hold for almost every uh, configuration of the potential. Because remember that when we're dealing with random Schrodinger, we're dealing with a whole family of operators, basically. So these are the two aspects, dynamical aspects, how the, how the wave function evolves in time and how the spectrum behaves. Okay, another manifestation of localization um, is uh, looking at the integrated density of states and one sees a special behavior near the band edges. And this is also because of the disorder. Um, so first, the definition of the integrated density of states, where we define it as, as follows, this is the limit of the eigenvalue counting function. So uh, we have here, um, we count, we restrict our operators so, so, to some finite volume. There we have a discrete spectrum, and then we can count the eigenvalues since our operator is uh, lower than bounded. So we can count the eigenvalues below a certain threshold normalize this quantity and then take the limit. And this limit exists for the Anderson model under the conditions that I just mentioned earlier, uh, over goricity. And uh, what happens now with the, okay, this function exists, is deterministic. And what happens with its, uh, with its asymptotics? So it's interesting to see how, how this function behaves. This function uh, is a function on the spectrum of the operator. And what happens is that if we have uh, just the Laplacian or the Laplacian plus something periodic, we will see something like uh, the blue line. Uh, here in the graph, this is for d equals two, but in general, this would behave as e, the energy to the power d over two. And um, you see that this, uh, this is a polynomial, but when we have a disordered potential, this changes drastically because near the edge of the spectrum, this decays exponentially. And as an exponential, where we retrieve the e to the power of the over two here. Okay, so we know that for the Anderson model, oops, sorry. This, uh, we know that for the Anderson model, this exists and is deterministic, and this behavior, this ex exponential decay here near the, the bandage, is known as Lipschitz states. And it's a consequence of a large deviation principle. So that this is basically saying that, well, reaching uh, values of the potentials that are very, very low um, are, is rare. So this is a rare event. So we don't have many eigenvalues in this area. Um, so in a way, this is saying that the spectrum is thin. And this is used um, in proofs of localization. So if we're interested in dynamical localization, as what I mentioned earlier, um, the, leaf, the proving if it says is usually one step forward. Um, so this is, uh, and when we see if it says, we can have like a good guess that hmm, maybe localization holds in this regime since we have the if it says, although this is not equivalent. Um, okay, well, there's maybe some um, names here. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm not mentioning many names because the literature is really huge. But uh, just a few names that, um, if, if you're interested, you should look at some people that have made big contributions to this. Um, okay, so what do we have then as a summary for these disordered uh, operators? We uh, can see dynamical localization in certain regions of, um, of, the, uh, of the spectrum. We have no propagation of the functions and uh, pure point spectrum. Um, but what happens in the rest of the spectrum when this does not hold? Well, there is where we have the localization, the original name. Um, and this is to say the wave functions will propagate and the spectrum of the operator will be continuous. Now, um, there are some conjectures about this. So the localization remains a big uh, open problem in the area. Um, in, we know that in dimension one, uh, the operator, as soon as we have some randomness, uh, we will have localization in the whole spectrum. So that's localization is very strong. Um, in dimension two, 
uh, people expect to have localization everywhere, but actually from a mathematical point of view, what we can show so far is only in the band edges or a strong disorder. That's all we can, can show uh, for the moment. And there is a conjecture that says that in dimension three and above, there is a transition between localized and the localized state. So we should see in the spectrum a transition from the region near the bandage where we would have localization. And then inside the band, in the core, we should see the localization and continuous spectrum. So we would also, in particular, have this transition from spectral to continuous, uh, sorry, the spectral transition from pure point to continuous spectrum for the operator. Now, this is, and this conjecture is a reminiscent of what happens for random walks. So um, the Laplacian, we know that is uh, associated to simple random walks. We have a particle that can move to the left and to the right with the same probability, only nearest, nearest neighbors jumps. And this in the limit, uh, this generates uh, a stochastic process that we know as the Brownian motion. And there is a, uh, when you will study transitions for these stochastic processes, they're interested in the behavior of recurrence and transients. So that this recurrent means that the part, the, the walker will, will start at some point and then eventually will return. And that is transient is that it will start at some point and it will go away uh, without coming back eventually. And we know that in dimensions one and two, uh, the Brownian motion and the run walker are recurrent and dimension three and above, they're transient. Now, what happens if we modify this a bit random walk and we allow for longer jumps? So when we allow for longer jumps, we can think of a probability, um, uh, a, a, a transition probability of this form that is uh, polynomially. And people have studied this in the probability literature and they have seen that if you have a decay that is a dimension plus alpha, and this alpha is between zero and two, then this in the limit is produces an alpha stable Levy process, which is like, I mean, it's like uh, if the Brownian motion had jumps. So you have something that is not, uh, that is actually discontinued. And um, to, to, um, to allow for the long jumps in the, in the space. And the generator of this type of processes are uh, the fractional Laplacian, where uh, this alpha here corresponds to the exponent in the uh, Laplacian. Now, people have also studied the uh, transition, the recurrence and transience transition for these uh, walks. And uh, the transition depends on this uh, alpha parameter. And in dimension two and above, this is transient. So, um, so you see that your dimension for transients went down a bit because you allow for these long jumps. And in dimension one, there is a transition depending on the, on the exponent. So in dimension one, this work is transient for very small parameters here, exponents between zero and one, and it's written for alpha bit one and two here, then we recover the, the usual behavior of the Laplacian in this regime. And um, so, this, um, so this transition then makes us think that, well, if we consider now a, ran, uh, a random operator, an Anderson model, but instead of the Laplacian, we have the fractional Laplacian, well, that should say something about the transition that would happen in that, operator, in that model. Um, so now, some other motivations to study fractional models, well, they, um, people studying highly connected networks study uh, diffusion using this, this model because you have, uh, you have connections everywhere. So you, so you have uh, long jumps naturally. Um, there's also in physics, there is a physicist that has to develop what it's called fractional quantum mechanics. This is quite um, recent from the 2000s when he considers uh, fractional derivatives everywhere. Well, fractional derivatives in general are well studied in probability and, um, and PEs. And we're interested in this relation to uh, these Levy alpha stable stochastic processes. And, and this is not new. Already in 89, Carmona, Chen Masters, and Simon, they exploited this connection to study uh, quasi relativistic Schrodinger operators. So, operators of the form 
square root of the Laplacian plus some mass. And they studied some spectral properties of, of these operators using this connection to stochastic processes. And one nice thing about these models is that they exhibit anomalous diffusion. And one question that comes from, that arises from this um, projection that I just showed is that this, the, the delocalization region is uh, still an open problem. It's very, very hard. Um, but one question, one middle, uh, if we were to, well, we're not so interested in the delocalization, perhaps this is very ambitious, but one step would be to understand how localization breaks down. So what uh, can we do in the model to break down this localization property uh, to perhaps understand how delocalized states arise, uh, well, eventually, with some wishful thinking. So um, that was our motivation with Martin to study these fractional models, and uh, we, are going, we studied them in the discrete setting. So let's see what is known for the discrete setting. Um, so these operators have been very well studied in the continuous setting and uh, also with probabilistic tools, but in the discrete setting, I mean, the framework of difference operators, this is less so. Um, what is known in dimension one is that if we write the fractional Laplacian as this integral operator in, uh, in the discrete setting, uh, well, Chari, uh, Roncaltore, and Barona, they, they proved these um, asymptotics for, this, uh, for the kernel. So the kernel behaves as something that decays polynomially in the distance between the points. And the rate of decay here is one plus alpha, where alpha is the exponent. Uh, now, uh, this is 16. In 17, there were numerical um, results about diffusion, about its relation to Levy processes. Michalic and collaborators also studied the transition uh, in um, any dimension, uh, depending on the parameter alpha. And then more recently, in 2019, uh, Padgett um, and collaborators, they studied numerically this Anderson model. So if we take the fractional Laplace and we add a random potential, uh, they did a numerical work on it and showed that for a, a fractional uh, exponent, this model exhibits less localization than the standard Anderson model. Um, and they also studied uh, the regime where the exponent actually is slightly bigger, uh, uh, also non-integer, and they see that localization is enhanced as one would expect with a higher power. So this is something that we saw with Martin and we wanted to understand better. So how is this you know, breaks down the localization or uh, decreases the localization. So the first thing to, to, to study was, well, uh, the first thing we did, we considered this, uh, this uh, Anderson operator. So we have this parameter lambda here to modulate the, modulate the disorder. Uh, so now we can think of the potential as something between zero and one. And then if we want to make the potential strong, well, the, the disorder strong, we will just move the parameter lambda. And um, so, well, the fractional Laplacian, we, we define it just as a function of the usual Laplacian, which is this difference operator between nearest neighbors. And the potential is just a diagonal uh, matrix. It's, um, it acts multiplying at every side by a random uh, variable that is between zero and one, and that we assume to be regular. So, um, able to generalize this result by, um, by, by Chiari um, on the asymptotics of the kernel. So this holds now for every dimension. Now, this was probably known, but we couldn't find it in the literature. And what this is saying is that the fractional Laplacian is a, a well, and, and therefore the fractional Anderson model is a long range random operator. Now, long, long range random operators have been said in the literature, and I'm gonna come back to this later. So, um, and a way to, to see this very uh, quickly, I'm not gonna go into the proof, but it's really that when we look at the, uh, we look at this, uh, the symbol for the Laplacian, which is two minus two cosine to some power, fractional power, and this has a cusp. Uh, so this has a singularity. And the way to regularize the singularity is cusp is my multiplying by a factor 
that has this power due to the pass off. So then when one adds this factor there, one regularizes and are, is left with this behavior here, this term here. So okay, just so a question. can I ask a question? The, the parameter alpha can be any positive number or perhaps even a bit negative or? What Here it's between allowed? zero and two. It can be anything between zero oh, and so two. Oh, sorry, I missed it, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, actually this is important. That is uh, it's, uh, anything between zero and two. So your exponent here is, some, is anything between zero and one, okay? Um, yeah, I will come back to the power state. Um, okay, now as a are you going to comment on the uh, on the values of alpha? Um, yeah. I mean, outside this powers. range, or yes, okay, yeah. thanks. Extension. If uh -huh. um, so now, um, well, this this uh, the fact that this is a long range random operator. Well, these are these. Uh, People have studied localization for these uh, models, and in particular, the fractional moment method allows to prove localization for this uh, operator under the assumption that the disorder is very strong. So if the disorder is very strong, and the random variables are, uh, are very regular, so that means ID with a nice uh, density, then one can, one can find a, a parameter such that for all disorders stronger than that, one has that the operator has pure point spectrum um, in the whole uh, spectrum. And the associated eigenfunctions are at least polynomially decaying. So the eigenfunctions inherit the decay of the free uh, part, which is this, which is this uh, polynomial decay here. And um, now this only tells us that that is at least polynomial. It could be faster, but we don't actually. Um, it would be it would be very nice to show that they don't decay faster than that. That they really really uh, decay, but we we're not there yet. Um, and um, so you see, we maybe I, I call this weak localization. Maybe it's a bad name because I have the feeling physicists already talk about weak localization about something else. Um, so maybe, well, just, it, it's a spectral localization. So the, the spectrum is true point, plus this polynomial decay of eigenfunctions, which is not Anderson localization. And it's not dynamical localization. So we don't expect to see dynamical localization, but this we haven't been able to prove. Okay, now uh, these, uh, fractional moment method, this requires that the disorder is very strong. So if we wanted to remove this condition on the disorder, if we want to study fixed disorder, we would have to look at the bandages of our spectrum. And there, um, and for that, well, one of the ingredients usually in the proofs of localization advantages are Lifshitz states. So this was the exponential behavior of the anti density of states that I showed earlier. And here it is just to remind you of what, uh, what this uh, um, Lipschitz tails is. In the Anderson case, this is the Lipschitz tails result. The function decays exponentially, saying, implying that the spectrum is very, very thin. So it's very hard to find. Uh, and we know that the spectrum is, um, we expect it to be pure point. So, but we know that it's, it's very um, rare to find spectrum there. Although, Spectrum. Okay, so then the next step was, well, if we're interested in localization, we have to look at Lipschitz states, and then what happens with the Lipschitz states for the fractional case. Now, this has been studied in the literature in the continuous setting. So now we look at L2 over D. The fractional Laplacian is uh, defined, can be defined in this way, so now as a singular integral operator. And here you see this kernel as, you as we have in the discrete. And um, there are many ways of defining the fractional Laplacian. And here I just took the one that was more like, evocative in terms of the kernel. Um, but you can look at this paper by Kosniewski um, where there are, um, where he treats all the possible uh, definitions and equivalence between them. Now, what happens now with the fractional Anderson model? If we perturb this 
continuous Laplace, uh, fractional Laplace by a random potential, then one gets fractional Lipschitz states in the continuous setting. And this was first studied by Okura in 77, very shortly after um, Nakao um, gave a proof of Lipschitz tales using probabilistic uh, methods. And he studied the case of Poissonian random potential. Uh, so that is a random potential that is not like the Anderson, but instead of having hills and valleys that are of random depth, what we have is um, uh, the points where we have our potential are uh, distributed as a Poissonian process. So they are distributed in space, but they all have the same height. So the disorder really comes from the position. And, um, and then in uh, 19, um, Katarzyna petrushka Pauba and Camille Caleta, they studied the case of Anderson potential and they obtained fractional literary cells as Okura did. Um, and I have to say that um, uh, this uh, group in Poland have studied a lot this uh, fractional um, Anderson model with Poissonian potentials on uh, fractals too, and studied Lipschitz cells on those settings. Um, and uh, these proofs here are with a probabilistic method. So using uh, the Laplace transform of the eigenvalue counting measure, and then, um, and then using uh, feynman katz formulas, using Taubian theorems, and then uh, obtaining this, this estimate. So they rely on Freeman Katz formulas. And in the discrete setting, we, we couldn't do that. So uh, we were, uh, we knew that this, well, what we have to get is this. So the, Lipschitz, the fractional Lipschitz scales is this exponential uh, asymptotic, but now you see that instead of having d over two here, we have, it's like having d over two divided by alpha over two, which is the exponent on the Laplace. Okay, so we see again the Laplace appearing here, the fractional Laplace in this case. Okay, so with Martin, we found uh, for the discrete setting, so for our difference operator, uh, fractional Lipschitz cells. And uh, the way to prove this is um, it's actually very close to the. We can follow the same proof as the standard um, uh, analytical way of proving this. Once one realizes that uh, one has a Dirichlet normal bracket, so what one does in order to study this um, this uh, this function is well, we restrict our our operator to a finite volume. Oh, here there should be a. I just remind you that here this is a limit. Sorry, I forgot to say the to, to point uh, write down the limit. But actually, one can bound this above by something of this form. Uh, so now here we're counting the AM values in this interval minus infinity to E, which is actually just zero to minus infinity in this case, because our spectrum starts at zero. And then uh, the key observation here is that taking a fractional power is, uh, this application is operator monotone. So whatever inequality you have in terms of operators will be preserved under um, taking these fractional exponents. And so we have, we know that there is a Dirichlet normal bracketing for the Laplace, for the usual Laplace. The Dirichlet normal bracketing, well, it's, it's known um, in the continuous setting. Uh, you have Dirichlet boundary conditions, Neumann boundary conditions, and you have that when you restrict your Laplacian to a box with these boundary conditions, then you have an operator that with Dirichlet boundary conditions, it lifts the spectrum, and with Neumann boundary conditions, it goes lower. Now, this can be. Uh, so in the discrete setting, one can define similarly boundary conditions, Dirichlet and Norman, that respect this bracketing, this inequality between operators, so that the Dirichlet restriction will lift the spectrum and the Norman will lower the spectrum. And uh, we use this, and then we take the fractional uh, exponents of this, and there we have um, a lower and upper bound for our uh, fractional Laplacian. And then we work with this as the usual, uh, as in the usual way with the usual Anderson model, where one works with the Dirichlet and Norman restrictions. So then one has to study the um, ground uh, states for these, ground states for that, try to get 
upper and lower bounds. And, um, and then, of course, we have everywhere this, um, this uh, fractional power. So you see here, this operator now has this discrete spectrum. So taking the power of this is just taking the powers of the eigenvalues. And then we keep track of this exponent and then this exponent appears. So it's, uh, the key observation is really this, that we can have a Dirichlet normal bracket with these fractional exponents. Now, um, we have an extension of this to random perturbations of Laurent matrices. So what we do here is that um, we, instead of considering now uh, the a fractional Laplacian, um, we consider a uh, by infinite topics matrix, or a, it's also called Laurent, Laurent matrix. And this matrix is associated to a symbol. So what we have here is an operator that acts in the, so, so this is a matrix with, uh, of diagonal terms A and minus N. And these terms here, these coefficients, are the Fourier coefficients of the symbol F. And uh, so you have this, uh, this relation between uh, functions. Oh, sorry, this is L, L infinity. So this is a bounded function over the torus and uh, your matrix. And this matrix has uh, of diagonal elements everywhere. And, um, and now we're interested in putting a random, a, a diagonal random perturbation on this matrix and see if we can say something about the Lifshitz states. And we make some assumptions. So um, we ask this function to be continuous, but it might be, and we ask, ask it to be differentiable out, outside a, a finite number of points. So there might be points where it's not differentiable. So, so this to allow for cups, cusps. So we want to also be able to include the case of the fractional Laplacian here, but to be more general. And we allow this to have a finite, uh, we allow it for finitely many points where it's not differentiable. And also for finitely many points where it attains its minimum. And we ask that in the minima, the minima is attained in this way as a power of, uh, this behaves as a power of, of the energy. So maybe I will just, uh, if we make a picture here, I will, in any case, I have a picture in the next slide, but um, can I annotate? Yeah. So you can think of this as a function that will be perhaps something like this. You know that the frac well, you know that the fractional um, that the usual Laplacian is something like that. Um, but here we allow for these and other uglier things. Okay, so we allow the minima to be uh, any power, including cusps. Okay, and for this case, we also have uh, Lifshitz states, and we see that um, here in the exponent, where before we had, uh, well, d over alpha. In this case, dimension is one, so they will have one over something. We see that um, this behavior here is uh, the maximum of these powers here. So it's a, we allow for different possible minima. So we take the maximum of all these powers, and then this will tell us how the integrated density of states behaves at the edge of the spectrum. And this. Uh, this is suggesting well that this tells us that the IDS really behaves as um, an exponential of something that has the behavior of the free part here. So this is the behavior of the integrated density of states of the kinetic part. This is the e to the power v over two that we see before. This was this is the behavior of the Laplacian. And here we see the behavior of the uh, tablets uh, part. Um, now, this is, so we have, therefore, this result for long range uh, operators, because our, our tablets matrix is a long range matrix. Um, what had been done in the literature was um, people have been able to consider um, matrices with exponentially decaying of diagonal terms. So we were able to generalize this to polynomially uh, well. Yes, polynomially decaying ones. And you can see this uh, Friedrich Club uh, generalized this for 
did this in, in the late 90s for um, kinetic of parts uh, with uh, exponentially decaying of diagonal terms. OK, so this is the ex extension. And here I come back to the power, uh, uh, Daniel, that I was telling you before. So here we allow for any positive power. Um, still positive. Um, not necessarily fractional. The fractional is included here. Integer powers are included here, but of course we, we know how those behave. Powers of the integer powers of the Laplacian are banded matrices. But here we allow for anything in between. Um, okay, so again we have Lipschitz tests, and the proof is actually a, it's similar to what we saw earlier. The key again, so here we have pictures of examples of um, of of the symbol, what the symbol could look like and how it could attain the minimum. And then what we do is that we, um, we sandwich the symbol um, by, by symbols that are similar. Like, so this is similar to the symbol of the Laplacian. Um, so we sandwich the original symbol, we, low, we bound it below and above by symbols of this type either a product of symbols of two minus two cosine or um, the, a maximum of this. And what happens is that uh, Martin, he obtained a Dirichlet number bracketing for banded matrices, because these they, these, they have the structure of the Laplacian to some power. Um, now, if the power here is fractional, then we go back to the, pre to the previous proof that we had for the fractional Anderson. But if the power is not uh, fractional, if it's, well, if it's integer, or if it's something in between, if it's um, something bigger than one, but not integer, we can write this. The idea is to write this as, uh, for example, I will do it here, is to write this just as um, some power that is uh, integer to some, power that is fractional. So we just rewrite the powers here. And then here, what we see is an integer power of the Laplacian, and that is a banded matrix. And uh, Martin, he studied the Euclidean normal bracketing uh, for banded matrices. Um, and um, what happens here, well, we, we needed this extra result because the usual definition of the Euclidean and Neumann uh, restrictions for the discrete setting for the discrete Laplacian do not hold in all generality, so they weren't good for when we had larger bands. So he found what are what are the what is the right definition of the Euclidean band preconditions in the case when we have a band of width, let's say n, and and then what we have here is similar to what we had earlier, that is the have um, a to some fractional power, and then we can proceed with the proof. So this is the extension that we have. And um, now I would like to just to finish up, to go back to this question of uh, localization. Well, we can prove if it's this, but what happens now with localization? Um, so as I, I had mentioned earlier, the um, operators that are long range with random uh, with the random potential have been considered in the literature. This is what we know. If we have a decay that is of this form, um, if our kinetic part decays as uh, the difference of between the points uh, to some power gamma, what do we know? So Abel Klein in the late nineties he showed Anderson localization assuming that the off diagonal terms were exponentially decaying. That is known. That was also considered in the fractional moment uh, method. Um, isomamal channel of, um, well, this is the result that actually we used, that if the disorder is strong enough, we can find, uh, we can have a state in the localization. Um, now, there is also work by Jacek and Molchanov in the late 90s, where they studied the case in dimension one. And um, they consider the K that is stronger than under 
a decay that is stronger than eight, so this power here is stronger than eight, then they find a pure point, um, pure point spectrum. And, um, and they also are able to lower the, the power to show that there's no AC spectrum. But the, um, so uh, I'm gonna mention this in a second again. And more recently, uh, Yun Feng Chi, uh, he, he developed the multi-scale analysis um, that uh, Abel uses in the late 90s. He, um, he came up with a multi-scale analysis that allows for long range operators, but again, he has a very strong condition on the decay. So in his results, the decay has to be like, like this, like much bigger than the dimension. And none of these cases covers our case, the case of the fraction of the plasma, that is a very weak decay. So this is barely integral. Um, so none of these cases covers the case that in dimension one would be one plus something between one and three. Um, so at the moment, the question is, is there localization uh, for these operators without the disorder, a strong disorder condition? Um, in arbitrary dimension. That is one question. And also what happens in dimension one, there is this um, conjecture of, the, of a transition. So uh, remember that when we talked about uh, the random walk with long jumps, um, people have studied this, this uh, transience and recurrence transition. And in dimension one, for the random walk, we know that the random walk is transient for alphas between zero and one. So let us just, uh, so here in the Laplacian, this would be the Laplacian without the exponent between zero and one half. That would be transient and recurrent for an exponent between one half and one. And, um, and actually this is mentioned in Jackson and Molchanov's uh, paper. They are trying to go in that direction and this is how they, they expect to, they were expecting to, to study this uh, transition, um, but their method requires uh, this sort of a condition on the decay that doesn't, uh, doesn't go lower than that. Um, so now the question is, uh, well, what happens with, uh, if we add a random potential? We would expect, I mean, if we believe, uh, if we argue as in the, under, the conjecture for the Anderson model, the usual Anderson model, we would expect to see extended states, if the, uh, some extended states, even in dimension one, if the alpha is very small, um, and localization if alpha is in the other range closer to the usual Laplacian. And um, well, to, to see, well, this is intuitive also, because this alpha, when alpha is very small, then this is pushing away. I mean, the operator becomes very non-local. So this is pushing up away the propagation while the potential is trying to localize. So usually this, um, the way of seeing this is saying, well, there is a balance between what happens with the kinetic part and what is the, the potential part doing. Um, and in the Anderson model, we know that well in the bandages is the, potential that dominates. And now it would be uh, interesting to see well, what happens when the potential is much stronger delocalizing. And this is uh, one of the things that we would like to um, study in the future or, or if somebody already did it, um, perhaps <laughs> to, to see uh, what is done also about this in the literature. And um, with this, I would like to, well, to finish, but not before uh, sending an announcement, and you can cut this from the video later on. But um, we are uh, with some colleagues here in France, we're organizing a summer school um, in late June and July. It's over five days, and the days are going to be short just to accommodate everyone. So just like what you're doing here at this seminar, to accommodate people from the East and from the other side of the ocean, from the West. Um, and we're gonna have courses on, mini courses on spectral theory and random works because it would be interesting to understand better these connections. Um, and of course, random shooting your operators. So uh, with that, and oh, and this school is uh, aimed for master and PhD students, but of course everyone's welcome.
So if you have students interested, you let them know. And it will be on site or online? No, it will be online. It will be online. It's too, I mean, the situation is not, uh, sure. it's not good for, for doing things in presence yet. I mean, it's slowly going, it's slowly improving. We don't want to spoil that. So yeah, for this year, it will be uh, online. But yeah, I mean, we're gonna make an effort to make you know something interesting and not to to avoid some fatigue with the, the way that we schedule things, um, and with a lot of interaction. So I hope that we will have a very diverse audience. So with that, then I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Constanza, for for the very nice presentation. Um, are there questions? So I think I have one. Um, so what, can one say something about uh, uh, somehow appearance, I mean, somehow localization away from the unperturbed spectrum, right? So yeah, I would like to take uh, the strength of the disorder small, and I would like to prove that the spectrum is pure point uh, somehow uh, at a certain distance from the unperturbed spectrum. I mean, there are results for the usual Anderson model about it. And I was wondering if uh, something is known uh, for this um, fractional Anderson model as well. Oh, actually, I, I don't think anything is known. So localization hasn't, to our understanding with Martin, hasn't been well studied in this case. Um, okay. So for, for the fractional, so as I, as I mentioned, for this is a long range operator, but with a very, very weak PK. This is not known. And um, I think we, um, and with weak, with weak disorder, um, as I mentioned, not, I don't think anything is known about the, uh, about the spectral localization. Um, not close to, I mean, not outside, away from non perturbed spectrum. Um, that should be easier, mm -hmm. but um, actually at the moment I cannot say. So we are, um, with some other colleagues from Dusseldorf, actually we were looking at the, at the continuous setting R at the Gaussian, um, the Gaussian fractional model. So where we have, when you have a, a, an operator that has the fractional Laplacian and then the, the randomness is Gaussian. So then your spectrum is the whole real line. And then one sees that outside, so you, the spectrum of the Laplacian is half a line. Yeah. And then to the minus infinity, of course, you don't have the Laplacian and you already see the potential. Mm -hmm. And that the asymptotics there are, are, are the same as in the Anderson case. Because you don't have, you don't see anything of the, of the Laplacian. Um, and then, I, I expect, but this is really something that we want to do, to look at localization there, because perhaps there might be easier to prove localization, but at the moment um, it's, it's hard, mostly because, because of what the localization proofs need is to, you cut your, your operator into boxes, and then you have to compare boxes. You have to increase the size of the box. And you have to compare your information at a certain scale and, and compare it with a higher scale, with a bigger scale. And the fact of having a fractional Laplacian changes the geometry of the space. So um, all, the, all the structural estimates, like Com Thomas estimate, um, geometric resolvent, uh, uh, geometric um, resolvent inequalities, um, they're, they're spoiled in a way because you have, usually you have only boundary terms that are neglectable. But now with the fractional Laplace, you have a lot, a lot that you cannot neglect. And this is the main obstacle at the moment that we see uh, with the localization proofs. Mm -hmm. That is like making a proof of, like trying to prove localization in a space that is different. So the Euclidean, it's uh, really, you're adding, your, 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 your boundaries are huge. Mm -hmm. This is what we cannot uh, handle at the moment, not yet. Mm -hmm. uh, we hope someone can, but at the moment we, we don't see how. This is a bit, um, uh, a bit problematic <laughs> that uh, multi-scale analysis doesn't, doesn't work. 
um, and uh, fractional moment method so far not, doesn't work either. So maybe one has to think of other things. Okay, thanks. May I have a question? Uh, so, yes. uh, what kind of methods uh, could you say more about methods that are used? So, so you mentioned that that some authors use probabilistic methods. So yes. Wh what is the difference between probabilistic methods and uh, and other kinds of methods? So, so what what is actually uh, the difference? So for the for the um, uh, for the issues, um, you have that. Um, so you study, you use Feynman cards formulas to relate. You have your IM value counting function. Then you make a, you take a Laplace transform, and with this exponential minus the parameter in the Laplace transform, you you call the semi group of the operator. And the semi group of the operator of your Hamiltonian, you can write it using Feynman cuts format. Okay. Well, okay. And so, so, so by by a probabilistic uh, method, uh, people mean studying the semi semi group generated by this uh, operator and uh, uh, using the Feynman cuts. Is yes. It? Okay. Yes. yes. And then, uh, how do you define the restriction? Is also not uh, the restriction to a box. You define it and you have to define it as, okay, what do you do with the exit times of your Brownian motion? Uh, well, in this case, you don't have a Brownian motion, right, for your Feynman cuts formula, but you have an alpha uh, levy process. And then you define, how do you define the boxes? That's actually a, a question. Uh, the people in this probabilistic setting, they do it in a certain way. Um, and uh, and so they don't use the Dirichlet normal bracket. Oh, okay, okay. And we do. And actually this is the main, the main thing that allows us to do this, that, that in, with, in the analytical approach, you, you do everything with the Dirichlet normal bracketing. Um, and uh, once you have the Dirichlet normal bracketing, you can, you can bound above and below your function very nicely. You work with eigen values. So, um, uh, well, so why why do, say why do pro probabilistic people refuse to use uh, uh, oh, online? Wait, no, no, I have to say something. With the probabilistic tools, they have much better results because they they have much. We what we have is asymptotics. We have actually a log log estimate, and this is standard in Anderson model. I mean, everybody, if you look at any result on the theory of random shooting, you find log log estimates. For, for the, so this estimate here, this is in the sense of a log, log, and so you forget some correction terms. But actually with probabilistic methods, uh, Katarzyna Pituszka-Baruba and Kamilka Ledeha, they're able to obtain much more refined bounds, and they're really able to get all the terms, all the corrections there. So it's actually pretty powerful machinery. And I would ask the other, uh, my question would be in the other sense, like why are we not using more of these methods? Okay, so so let, let me ask this question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so why why don't you use uh, the probabilistic methods? Um, I I I will I will just just give me a bit of time. Come on, I'm teaching a lot. Yeah, please. Okay. <laughs> I mean, come on, I'm a... <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying. Um, yes, this is a next step to, to try to get into more probabilistic, try to understand the probability better. And actually to even support this, uh, this is in the direction that we're trying to get with this, uh, with this school. Um, Katarzyna will be there giving a talk precisely on integrated density of states. Uh, to show us, you know, uh, this uh, this approach, um, which is a bit uh, well, it, I guess it depends on. I mean, what do you have? You know, it depends on what are the what are the uh, estimates that you have available, and then which one is better. I mean, do you want to work on the continuous setting? Do you want to work in the setting? 
very uh, much better. Uh, it's adapted to, to that. Um, but then for the localization part, it's, this seems to be more challenging. Maybe one needs to like start trying to get more ideas from other places. And, uh, and that is precisely my, my goal and Martin's and, uh, and our colleagues to try to understand better this connection. So hopefully in the next years, I can tell you more about it. Thank you. Thank you. Other <clears throat> questions or comments? Oh, so perhaps another question. So is it possible to, to put the, the randomness in the Laplacian rather than in the diagonal? And with a fractional mm -hmm. parameter, perhaps you, you can make the link with random matrix theory because it is a bit like having lots of off diagonal terms. Um, actually, yeah, I, was more, I, I honestly don't know if, um, I, I don't know, I don't know how to do it. Um, I know that the Anderson model, I mean, people have looked at random hopping terms. Um, but uh, to add this uh, to this model, um, ah, you mean because we have banded, because we have more banded matrices, we have wider bands in this setting. Um, uh, well, I'm not exactly sure what um, I would like to, to have, but the, the fact that you have this parameter alpha, I mean, the, um, the fraction means that effectively it's a bit longer range. Yeah. So, so, so I wonder whether yes, um, yes. you can find a way to, to design a Laplacian, I mean, like short range, but then you have a parameter alpha and then it would effectively be more like was a random matrix. Mm. But That's perhaps a with question. a lot of correlated hopping, hopping terms. That's yeah. a good question. Uh, I, I that's a good question, actually. Yes, I, I don't know if one could do that. Mm, correlations are a bit tricky. I mean, one relies awfully a lot on the independence. Um, but uh, yes, but um, yeah, perhaps it's, it would be worthwhile to, to look at. Mm, thank you. Other questions? Okay. Okay, so if not, uh, let's thank uh, you for, for, the, for the nice presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.